And so maybe uh, we would want to begin the conversation by highlighting the, the, the challenges that the court is facing. Well, there are s several challenges because that's, uh, as a new body, of course, it will have to be tested. It will have to be tested for um, efficacy, but also for something that uh, people will be watching and is consistency. I'll start right away by saying that one of the criticisms that have been formulated since the uh, ICC has started functioning is the fact that uh, the cases that the court has taken up are all referred to Africa. And uh, Africans are not taking this uh, lightly, meaning that uh, they, they voice the suspicion that the court will be um, a way for the developed world to uh, question and to uh, uh, in, verify and to uh, maybe criticize, or even worse, the less developed world. So I think that is one challenge we'll have to face. Would you, would you agree with this challenge? Do you feel that there is a bias in, uh, in how the, the... I think the only way of proving that there is no bias is to widen the scope of the, what the court is doing. And, and why would you... Uh, how do you account for the fact that there is this focus? Oh, yeah. There, there has been this focus on Africa I don't think it was the uh, something... Of ICC. Yes, I understand your question. I don't think that um, the question has been a, a purpose of uh, singling out Africa. If you look at the statue of the court, you will see that uh, the competence of the court is subsidiary. Uh, the court intervenes in cases when nation states are either unable or unwilling to prosecute uh, the crimes that are within the mandate of the court. Well, it happens that because of political reasons, uh, the state of justice in many African countries is not as structured as in other parts of the world. Therefore, it's easier to see situation where courts are neither able nor willing to, uh, to do that, which is a partial explanation. I think an effort should be made to find other cases in which uh, countries are unable or unwilling to prosecute, uh, because I'm sure that there are. So this is one of the challenges of the, of the ICC, making sure that it is uh, uh, non-biased. Yes. So what are the other challenges that the court is facing? Another challenge is to find the real cooperation of uh, states, uh, both um, state partners and countries that are not state partners. Let me very, be very frank. The fact that the United States is not a party to the statute is a problem because the U.S. is number one in many areas of the world. So it exerts a very important influence. And I think we should address that. Of course, there has been a change. And recently, under the new administration, there is a less hostile view of the court and also a, a a, an attitude which envisages cooperation short of membership. Mm -hmm. It's already a step forward. But I think that eventually also the United States will have to adhere to the court in order to give it more strength and in order also to give more credibility to the United States itself because uh, I don't think it's very consistent to be in favor of the court's competence in judging Muammar Gaddafi, but then not joining the court. So, so lack of universal membership, especially coming, I mean, uh, especially in, in the sense that uh, some very important countries are being left out, is one of, is a second challenge, if you That's will. It's uh, a, any other challenges? Yes, uh, the uh, enforcement of the decision of the court. So uh, tell us a bit about this. Let's say that somebody is um, indicted. Um, who is going to detain that person? Let's imagine it's uh, head of state of government. That's a big problem. Not only you cannot uh, go and uh, perform the d detention, uh, carry out the detention orders in the country itself, but even in other countries probably, um, governments will not be willing to participate in this, um, in this action. I'm talking, for instance, yes. the president of Sudan, uh, who I think can still travel in countries that are a member of the organization of African unity of OIC, 
without running too many risks. So these are some of the challenges, and so these challenges they take place in the context of of of. of of, of what is the framework or the, the normative and political framework mm -hmm. in the context of which these challenges take place? In other words, what is the philosophy yes, at the core of, of the problem? Absolutely, court? because we, you started with the problems, but let yes. me say something more positive. Yes. I think the existence of the court is extremely well, important. Well, if we start with the problem, we can finish <laughs> with some, on a positive note. On an upward. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So tell us a bit about sure. the philosophy at the, at the core of the court. The philosophy, first of all, the idea is that. Uh, we live in a global world where problems definitely do not stop at the, uh, at the borders. Uh, let's talk about environmental problems, organized crime, pandemic disease, uh, the effect of uh, financial crisis, uh, migrations. Nothing is really, can really be handled by the nation state as it used to be, you know. Therefore, I think we have to develop institutional tools, but not only institutions, but cultural tools and even ethical tools that are fit for our time. And our time is the time of global problems. One of the global problems is how do you prevent horrible crimes against humanity, war crimes? I'm talking about genocide. I'm talking about torture. I'm talking about the great. Uh, the hope is that nation states might be capable of addressing them on their own. But it happens that those crimes are committed usually with the reason, I would say, the pretext of some political cause that is considered as paramount. There are people who say that terrorism is not terrorism, it's for a good cause. There are people who say that torture is not torture if you fight against terrorism. I think the international community should do something to address those problems beyond what individual states are willing to do. Mm -hmm. No, no. No, so precisely, what are the crimes which fall under the jurisdiction of, oh, yes. of the court? And, and let's go back to this issue of, uh, because of ends and means, because this is what you are alluding to when you're talking about torture uh, is torture regardless yes. of the cause in the context of which it's happening. But first of all, the, 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 uh, the crime is falling and the... Well, the it's, first it's war crimes. No, first it's genocide, then war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. Uh, war crimes is the most classical one. It's humanitarian law. It's one of the most ancient components, parts of international law, which was developed also to regulate conflict. As you know, uh, in humanitarian law addresses means and targets of military action. You know, the Geneva Convention, the Hague Convention, and so on. This is the more classical part. Uh, crimes against humanity, as a matter of fact, had their debut uh, in uh, Nuremberg. And it's a very interesting thing to see that at that time, the international community was not ready to admit that crimes committed by state against their own citizens could be tried by an international court. In uh, Nuremberg, crimes against humanity were necessarily linked to war. They were uh, prosecuted insofar as they were connected to war. This was totally artificial, because if you think about That's the extermination, crimes. no, 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 crimes against humanity were an independent uh, item. Mm -hmm. It was war crimes and crimes against humanity. Crime against humanity was, for instance, could cover the, the Holocaust, the Shoah, the extermination of the Jews, because they're not a war crime. They were not involved in war. Yeah. And yet, it was, if you read the document, they were prosecuted insofar as they were a part of the okay, general yes. war concept. As I said, the international community was not ready to introduce human rights, mm -hmm. the violation of human rights, meaning the way that states treat their own citizens. Things have happened after that. You know, 1948, uh, the uh, human rights, uh, the conventions, the convention against uh, genocide, and so on and so forth. By now, crimes against humanity, meaning human rights, because this is what it, uh, has entered the uh, international law, uh, uh, but 
And this is why it's within the mandate of the ICC. Um, genocide, of course, one thing that has to be clarified is that the mandate of the court refers to crimes that were not created by the ICC. The only innovation is the crime of aggression. Mm -hmm. And this is why the crime of aggression is the more complicated, the most complicated, the most problematic of the different uh, fields of possible action of the so ICC. So war crimes, crimes against humanity? Genocide and crimes of aggression. Yes. These and so same. why did we um, introduce this, uh, this notion of crime of aggression in the context of ICC? There was a, it was in the Rome Statute, but there was some problem in defining it. Now in Kampala, in 2010, which is which is the conference of uh, revision of the Rome Statute, among other things, there was a step forward, which introduced also the definition of the crime of aggression. Uh, it remains very problematic, of course, because it, it requires uh, the, the, it defines the crime of aggression in certain terms that will have to be interpreted. You, 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 you mentioned uh, in, uh, in your conversation mean, uh, a minute ago uh, terrorism. Is terrorism and uh, the jurisdiction of, of the court? There is a big criticism of the court saying, look, you didn't put among the items that you can include in the mandate terrorism. So terrorism is the most yeah, uh, that's terrible problem. Well, this is not the case. If you read both Article 7 and Article 8, meaning war crimes and crimes against humanity, it, they can be applied to terrorism because it says the use of force, the systematic use or an organized use of force against non-combatants or against private citizens. Uh, I think, and at a certain point, Article 7 talks about state or organizational policy. So, so you're saying that... Al-Qaeda fits. So in the statute of the court, there is a workable definition yes. of, uh, of terrorism and of uh, uh, applicability of, uh, yes. of the court to terrorism. And yet, when it comes to international negotiations, it seems that we're not able I to know. come up with a, a definition of terrorism. How do you explain this paradox? The paradox can be explained by this logical and political fallacy of defining terrorism in substantial terms, Terrorists. as if it was a cause. Uh, war against terror, it doesn't make sense. It's as if I declared war against the Kalashnikov. It's a means, not an end. Mm -hmm. To prove that point, you, have, you can have terrorism for uh, a separatist movement, right? You can have terrorism for a religious movement, but you can also have terrorism in favor of the environment. The Unabomber was sending out bombs to laboratories or universities because he wanted to defend nature, the trees, against exploitation by science and by technology. Wasn't the cause good? Very good. Yet, Kaczynski was a terrorist. So, Or you can have terrorism against, uh, um, let's say, abortion clinics. For some people, Fighting against abortion is a legitimate cause, and they put bombs. Or you can have terrorism against experiments on animals. It, they're all real cases. Mm -hmm. And in the other opposite end, you can have terrorism for things that are really despicable. The mafia in Italy, at a certain stage, used terrorism. They put bombs in the Uffizi gallery as an act of terrorism, because they wanted to send a message to the state in order to obtain something from the state, which is the logic of terrorism. You strike at an undefended civilian target in order to impress it upon your adversary that the adversary has to do something. And, and so uh, in order to achieve clarity on, on what terrorism is about, you are telling us that we have to, to, to distinguish uh, means and ends. We have to dissociate. Uh, yes. the practice of terrorism from what it stands for Absolutely. and focus on uh, the modalities of force that it is all about. Exactly. So, okay. And it's, 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 yes. It seems quite uh, logical yes. and common yeah, sense. Yeah, but it's difficult. Why is it so difficult that I we're don't not know. Really able I, to... I give you an example. 
I like to quote the fact that if you go and see a convention on terrorism that was approved by the organization of the Islamic Conference, OIC, in Ouagadougou, I think, there is an Article 1 that defines terrorism in a way that we would be able to accept. But then there is an Article 2 that says, however, liberation struggle is not terrorism. Liberation struggle is not terrorism. Would you imagine anybody uh, on a convention against genocide saying genocide is terrible? However, liberation struggle is not genocide. So what does it mean? It means that you want to find an exemption of your cause mm -hmm. from the definition of terrorism or genocide or whatever. The ICC uh, statute doesn't talk about causes. It doesn't say if you torture or, or kill people for religion, for uh, sexual orientation, for it doesn't say. You don't need to say that. So it, it, it is about what is done to people, regardless of the cause, yes. regardless of the reasons for, 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 for which it's done and, yes. so on and so on. And it's very sad that the international community is not ready to accept that at least for the most horrendous ways of exerting violence on fellow humans, meaning genocide, terrorism, and torture, don't forget, we should say those things have no justification. So precisely, if, if, if by focusing on, on the way uh, force is being uh, used, I mean, it's, it's, it's easier to achieve a, a walkable uh, definition of terrorism, then wh what would be your definition of terrorism as separated oh, from, yes. uh, from, oh, from ends and, and, I think and, it's, and it's, just cause or whatever? I think it's extremely so, easy in the sense that terrorism is the use of uh, organized violence against uh, civilian targets, soft targets. It has nothing to do with who you are and who the adversary is. Um, before I quoted uh, uh, a, a very interesting case, there was a, um, a Dutch journalist very sympathetic to the Palestinian cause who went to uh, Palestinian territories and interviewed families of uh, jihad, uh, of the uh, jihad shahids, in the sense that people who had blown themselves up in, on buses in Tel Aviv. As I said, it was very sympathetic. And then he writes at a certain point of his article, suddenly I remembered that my father was a Dutch fighter in the resistance against the Nazis, period. He would have never put a bomb on a German bus, period. So, is it the cause? No. If he had attacked a German tank, he wouldn't have been a terrorist. Now, the problem is that some people who are in the tanks, when they are attacked, they say that those who attack them in the tank are terrorists. Forget it. So, so in, 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 in a way, your argument is that uh, the ends doesn't justify the mean, and, and by focusing on the means, we can really solve the definition of problem. Human action is about means, not ends. Because about ends, we each have our own, and we will disagree on that. And yet people who, 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 uh, who call upon uh, you know, these uh, modalities of action which you, you feel are not really justified, they do so partly because there is a lack of parity in terms of uh, power struggle. I mean, people who, who call for, for terrorist actions will do so partly because uh, the enemy is so overwhelming that... Uh, oh, yeah. True. It depends on whether we accept that or not. But for, for on this, you are clear. Yes. And is it the only uh, example of situations in the context of which uh, we cannot really link the two ends and means as a way to oh, justify uh, the means? Yes, I tell What about torture? I was about to get to torture. Yeah. Absolutely, I would get to torture because there are people who are saying if you use torture against uh, terrorism, uh, then you're justified. Well, it happens that in the Convention Against Torture, there is no escape clause. I think there should be a few uh, ways of using violence that are not admissible, never. Actually, since humanity was not able to outlaw war completely, we tried to put some law into war, into, okay? So this is humanitarian law. Once you exert military force, you have to 
abide by certain limits, certain targets. But there are certain ways of violence that do not have to be regulated. They have to be excluded. I think the international community has accepted that for genocide. Have you ever heard anybody who makes distinctions saying, mm, maybe there is a good genocide if you do it to defend your country or to fight against a, an evil enemy? Nobody will say that. But for torture and terrorism, yes. So, so how do you explain this difference? Because nobody wa because everybody wants to exempt their own cause, uh, putting it above judgment and above uh, condemnation. Uh, might be natural, but it's not acceptable. So now, okay, so it, no, it's, it's an interesting point. So, so you are telling us that uh, terrorism can fall under uh, the direction of the court and... Uh, oh, it, uh, it can. It, it, yes. And, it can. And if you uh, read the articles, it, the, the word terrorism is not there, but the substance is there. Uh, the, the, the court has been in existence for a few years now. How would you assess the, the record, uh, the, the record of, the, of the court. I mean, do you think that it's doing well? Imperfect but promising, in the sense that... So imperfect in what sense and, and promising? Well, imperfect, as I said, because, for instance, it indicted only African cases. Part of the reason was because of the existence of ad hoc courts, of former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, because those two cases would have been naturally uh, in, within the mandate of the ICC. Uh, but they are going their own way. And I think those two courts were, in a way, useful to, to establish the need for a general court. What is really curious to me is that some people who support the ad hoc courts are against the ICC. How do you explain that? Because they're, the ad hoc courts are easier to control <laughs> than the general courts. And the they're also court. specifically addressing... A certain enemy. Yes. A certain culprit. Mm -hmm. Some people are afraid of the ICC because it's tout ça zimut, as they say in French, meaning it can strike anywhere. And so maybe it can strike me one day, too. The general mandate is uh, worrisome for some. Um, but at the same time, it is also promising. It is promising. So, it's the beginning. So, I, I say it's promising. Uh, the beginning of yes. what? The beginning of really international criminal justice. How so? It's, well, it's it's simple because... There are some rules that are already universal in international law, but there is no judicial mechanism to establish them and to uh, implement them. In a way, if you think about s things that already exist in international law, you will find that the ICC is not as new as it seems. First of all, um, as I said before, the crimes that are uh, within the mandate apart from the aggression, were not created by the ICC. They already existed. Second point, there is this thing like universal jurisdiction. For some egregious crimes, any state can uh, uh, prosecute them. And as you know, when General Pinochet was uh, uh, arrested in the UK, it was not the ICC. It was something that existed in international law. So it means that the f need to have some uh, tools, international tools, beyond national jurisdiction were already felt before the ICC. ICC is one more step, of course. What would be, uh, you, are, you are telling us that it's the beginning. So I, I assume that it's not enough. So what would be uh, additional uh, steps which would be required to really no. uh, more in, in conformity no. with your wishes, with the, an ideal a uh, sense of international criminal law, international justice to global justice? Universal membership, including that of the country that is, is many, more equal than the others. How many members so meaning far? Meaning the U.S. Well, I lost the count, but it's over well above 100 uh, countries that have ratified. So no, it's the, 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 the court is not, it's functioning and it has a wide majority of uh, uh, states that are members. But uh, the universal membership would be, of course, a goal. And not only the universal membership, but a more uh, balanced uh, docket, a more balanced uh, uh, range of cases distributed geographically in a way as not to prompt 
accusations of, of bias. Yeah. And, and so how could this happen? I mean, you know, not that it should happen, but I mean, how do we rebalance the targets? I think public opinion has a lot to do with that. And, uh, but also the people who will be directly, you know, the prosecutors, the, the, the judges, they will have to, to address that. Like all uh, new institutions, these are the first steps. But you know, like in all uh, um, international institutions, sometimes it's unfair to blame them for their shortcomings when their shortcomings are depending from the attitude of member states. Uh, so I think we should all... In terms of uh, rebalancing the targets, I mean, essentially the court focuses on individual responsibility, right? Yes, but there are a lot of nasty individuals all over the place. Yeah, but precisely, you know, and, and uh, in a way one could argue that uh, uh, individuals are, are the forefront of crimes in developing countries because institutions are, are lacking, right? Yeah, but I you agree. could have in developed countries uh, maybe individuals not at the forefront simply because institutions are very strong and they do the dirty work. Yes, and you so know... How the, do you end all these and you know, Yes, and you know the mandate also says of the court that it can intervene when the nation states are not able or willing to prosecute a case. And unfortunately in those cases that you quote, the ability and the willingness are weaker. But I am sure that there are some cases in Asia or in or in the Balkans or in Latin America that deserve attention of the court. What I'm, what I'm leading at is, you know, the court is focusing on individual responsibility for crimes. Yes. What about looking after and taking care of uh, institutionalized yes. responsibility for crimes? But let me finish something of the first question. Since the court should not distinguish between crimes that are really political and that are pseudo-political. For instance, a warlord usually is a warlord not for political reasons, but in order to have diamonds in West Africa or drugs in Afghanistan. So those individuals are well within the mandate yeah. of the court, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you are a drug dealer, pseudo-guerrilla in Colombia, to give you an idea, you deserve attention of the court. And this is Colombia, it's not Africa. As for state responsibility... Or what I would call institutionalized criminality. Absolutely. Which, is, which can be as lethal as the one coming from India. Yes, but institutionalized... Even small. Yes, but institutionalized criminality always turn into action by individuals. So, in, you know, it's a general principle of criminal law, even national criminal law, that criminal responsibility is individual. You don't, uh, you don't uh, try for for murder an institution. Mm -hmm. It's always a person. And, and yet, you have philosophers, Thomas Pogge being being one of them, who, uh, who argues that in fact uh, the, the way the world is structured is creating uh, so much inequalities that in fact uh, developed countries, for instance, have a responsibility in the death of or starvation of many oh, yeah. people. So how do we somehow assign responsibility and and pursue uh, in, in criminal terms, this, yeah. how, how do we go about I, this? I will break down uh, your question to a three-part answer. First of all, there is no doubt that there is moral responsibility. That's one. Yeah. Second, countries can be considered responsible for their action, but not by the ICC, by the International Court of Justice, ICJ. Don't forget that countries can be judged and they have been by yeah, the ICJ, uh, right? Yeah, but the ICJ and, is, is not... And is third, even um, collective responsibility or state responsibility in criminal terms has to turn into individual mm -hmm. action. I think the ICC turns uh, causality into imputation. Yes. There is always a cause. You can always say, I slaughtered a hundred people because that tribe slaughtered 200 of my people yesterday. This is causality. No, imputation. You did. Yeah, yeah. 
No, no, but I mean, you know, you, you, you made the point at the beginning of our conversation that, you know, the targets have been mainly people from developing countries. And of course, it makes sense because in these countries, the, the, the justice systems are very weak and, and countries are, are either unable or unwilling. Uh, but somehow, there's a bit of a systemic problem here. There is a systemic so, problem. So how do you go about this? Uh, there is a systemic problem. Um, definitely, there are, for instance, war crimes that can be committed also by developed countries, and sometimes even by developed countries against developing countries. There is no doubt about that. But let me add a general consideration. Mm -hmm. you, you see the point that I'm trying to make? About, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I will say that let us take justice within nation states, especially at the beginning of the formation of nation states, not after 300 years of democracy, of po political parties, of checks and balances. Let's talk about the courts in England in the 17th century. Do you think that those courts judged uh, the nobles and the uh, commoners in the same way? The rich and the poor in the same way? Definitely not. And yet, do you think that the existence of court uh, was uh, to be denied or it was better not to have any court because justice was imperfect? No, no, no. And yet, when we talk about international relations, suddenly we become very demanding. Either there is full democracy and full justice or it's better to have nothing. No, but that's not what I'm saying. But here, somehow, we, we, you know, we, we are focusing on, on existence of, of crimes in, 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 develop, in countries which are lacking the institutions of justice, the, 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 the institutional requirements for justice. And somehow, you know, we are at times, perhaps, I'm just asking the questions, letting developed countries off the hook on their own responsibility in terms yes, of... Yes, I agree with you. So, agree how do we, so this is a, an issue of global justice. So... You uh, shifted from law to politics. Yes. I think well, it's politics and ethics that we have to address these problems. And so as to affect the way that institutions work. So precisely the question then would be, you know, how can we bring these kind of questions into the realm of international criminal law so, so that we don't really have a narrow understanding of, of, of criminal responsibility? I don't know if it makes sense or not. It makes a lot of sense. But this is why these days, uh, think about also uh, humanitarian law. Why do we have a convention against uh, anti-personal minds? Which were the countries that promoted it? No way. It was an NGO. It was citizens who at a certain point said, this is not right. I think the same thing should happen for international criminal law. People should exert pressure on the fact that the court is not yet as balanced as it should be. Because maybe also people, individuals from developed countries should, could be indicted. We're not there yet, but I think one day we should be. The, the court, do you think that it has a, a positive effect in terms of uh, uh, in terms of incentive for people not to, com to commit crimes? Oh, yes. And, and second of all, do you think that it has a positive effect in terms of uh, having these countries which are lacking institutions to try to get their house in order? Yes. Uh, and there, how can we yes, measure this? There are two questions there. To me, one of the reasons why I am and full disclosure, I am in favor of the International Criminal Court in case you shouldn't have understood. It's because of its preventive uh, effect. The fact that a crime, war crime, crime against humanity, genocide, can be tried and sanctioned outside the nation state is uh, a deterrent against the commission of the crime. Because imagine people who cannot travel anymore because otherwise they can be detained anywhere. And this is a very important uh, tool. Uh, and uh, sorry, but I forgot the second question. The, 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 the second question is, do you think that the court has a positive effect in terms of, of having the country developing oh, yes. countries very often lacking yes. the institutions required to really uh, 
uh, for them to be able and willing to, to uh, address this crisis. You know crime. what's interesting, yes. that it has a The ICC, as a matter of fact, has exerted its own advisory role also for courts that are different from the ICC. For instance, Sierra Leone, uh, which has its own uh, uh, setting, and Cambodia, where there is a quasi-international, quasi-national tribunal. So, in a way, it is true that the ICC can set some standards and can even do some technical assistance on the national level to perfect mechanism which, in a way, would make the intervention of the court, of the ICC, not necessary. Because there is, we don't necessarily demand that all crimes be brought to The Hague. The ideal world would be for each country to be respectful enough of laws and of humanity so as to prosecute those crimes internally. But this is not realistic. So the ICC, in a way, it's on one way a deterrent against the commission of the crimes against the individual, but also a stimulus to national uh, judicial systems to shape up and to be capable of doing the job themselves. You mentioned earlier in the conversation that the U.S. is not a member, yeah. which is partly a problem because it is a very important country and so on. Do you know, I mean, what are the other examples of major countries not being uh, a member of, uh, of the ICC? Well, China is not a member. Mm -hmm. uh, and other countries, I don't remember other, other major countries. China and the U.S. are the biggest. And, and the reasons for, for China and, and uh, the U.S. Uh, not being a member are the same or are they different? More or less the same. In the sense their view of sovereignty is such that they don't want to submit it to any further limitation uh, by the existence of such a tribunal. And, and so the fact that they are not members means that they are out of the jurisdiction, the jurisdiction uh, uh, of the court, right? Uh, yes, they are to the jurisdiction of the court, but if, uh, if a crime is committed uh, on the territory of a uh, state party, then even those who are not state party can be the object of ICC competence. You mentioned uh, Libya earlier, I think, in our conversation. Uh, what about Syria? Uh, do you think that it could be... Uh, 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 a case which could fall under the direction of any we've all uh, you know any uh, direct, uh, I would say that uh, I actually don't know if Syria is a state party or not but I think that potentially the mechanism is applicable to uh, all cases uh, but I don't know in this case if Syria is a member or not